I'll never be the same. First Peter chapter four verse six reads like this For this reason the gospel is preached even to those who are now dead, so that though they may be judged according to human standards in regards to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. It's just one verse. This verse reads simple enough, but it's actually fairly complex to interpret. There are three common ways that this verse is interpreted. One we can rule out pretty quickly, but the other two require a little bit of uh, tug of war that we need to think through. The, the, first, the first one that I, I don't think is accurate, uh, it has some scholars interpreting this verse to mean that after people die, they have an opportunity to receive the gospel again. <clears throat> the scholars tie this verse back to that obscure section you might remember in First Peter chapter three, verses nineteen through twenty, talking about Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison and talking about Noah's time. And so, some people then tie this verse back to say that after people pass away, after they're going to face the eternal realities that we only now know uh, that we have to take on faith, when people are face to face with those realities, then they'll have another opportunity to receive the gospel. But it is always, always, always bad Bible study practice to draw firm conclusions based on obscure passages. And it's even worse when those firm conclusions drawn from obscure passages, uh, when, when you draw those conclusions and the obscure passages teach something different than what's clearly being taught in other sections of Scripture. It's always a bad idea to let something confusing trump something that's clear when you're reading the Bible. So one commentator says in regards to this that the interest in a possible correspondence between uh, chapter 3, verses 19, and chapter 4, verse 6 appears to be motivated by a desire to find a biblical expression for the universality of salvation. So for people who tie those things together, they're looking to try to find a way that salvation can be universal. People have a chance to receive the gospel after they're standing on the threshold of heaven or hell. No one would choose hell. Now, when you take in the overall context of First Peter into perspective, this interpretation makes even less sense. Thomas Schreiner explains, Peter exhorts the readers to endure persecution, knowing that they have the future of eternal reward. It would make no sense at all if you were to shift gears suddenly and promise a second chance to those who have rejected the gospel during this life. Almost the, so much of what Peter is saying in this letter is, hold on, heaven's coming, endure this now. This isn't the end of the story. It wouldn't make any sense to say, you don't have to endure this now because there's a different option later on. Further, the Bible clearly states that this life, right here and now, this is our only chance to receive the gospel. Hebrews 9.27 says that people are destined to die once and after that face judgment. While it might make for interesting speculation, it's always bad Bible study to let an obscure passage trump what's clearly taught in the word. So we can disregard this interpretation pretty quickly. Now, the second way scholars look at this verse, at verse 6, is to refer to believers who have died. Many good Bible teachers take this position, and it certainly does fit the context. I think this is a, a fine way to take this passage. They argue that in light of the persecution that these churches face, they can take heart because although Christians have passed away, they've suffered hard things, they maybe even have been killed for their faith, you don't have to worry about that. Because there's a better day coming. That they have been judged according to the flesh, but they live by God according to the Spirit now that they're dead. But this position has one weakness, I think. Peter doesn't deal with this issue anywhere in this letter. He doesn't, he doesn't address what happens to your loved ones who have passed away. He does talk about eternal realities for sure, but he doesn't take this on. Whereas, and Paul does in 1 Thessalonians, that's a significant portion of that letter. He deals with what's going to happen to people when they die. What happens to the people that I know who have died. But Peter doesn't touch this. The author of Hebrews does, Paul in 1 Thessalonians does, but Peter doesn't. 
So I think that at this point in his letter where he, he's, he's bringing things to, to a conclusion, I think it's unlikely that his intention is to introduce a completely new topic. It seems more likely to me that he is reinforcing some, some themes that he's already touched on to this point. And so on this verse then, I land with the more historical interpretation given first by Augustine in the 4th century, followed later by Martin Henry, or, uh, Matthew Henry in the 19th century. And I think that Peter is referring that to the gospel being preached to those who are spiritually dead. The gospel must be preached, must be shared with those who are spiritually dead so that they can live by God according to the Spirit. Now, the main critique that scholars have of this interpretation is that the specific theme of being spiritually dead hasn't been introduced yet either. But I think that's, that's not entirely true because while the specific phrase being dead in sin hasn't been mentioned, the biblical doctrine of original sin or total depravity, regardless, depending on how you want to look at that, the, the, the biblical doctrine of original sin has been undergirding so much of this letter to this point. It's typically used as an assumption even rather than as a main point of the teaching. I'll show you. Chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Chapter 1, verse 18. Just, just notice the passive language in this. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. Chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race. So you look at these themes, born again, ransomed, chosen. They all stand on the massive theological foundation of the biblical doctrine of total depravity. Being born with original sin, meaning that we are born into this world as sinners. We are sinners by nature and by choice. And now when I say this, please don't hear me to mean that people can't do good things. Sometimes this gets taken in the wrong direction. I know many people of many different faith systems who do many good things. Faith systems that I'd even include atheism in. I know many good atheists. I know neighbors who aren't Christians who are better people than me. Like, they do better things. So this biblical doctrine of original sin does not mean that people cannot do good things. It's not what this is talking about. But just because a person has the capacity to do good and does do good, that does not mean that they are completely, thoroughly good. In fact, I think you could argue that if a person has the capacity to do good and chooses not to, you could probably make a better case that they're not completely good. Like a wheel that's bent on a bike, we just cannot do fully what we know we're supposed to. Mothers know this well. How many moms have seen their kids do something nasty? Lie, rip a toy away from their brother or sister, just freak out in the grocery store pounding on the cart? How many mothers have seen their kids do something, hitting, screaming, lying, and just be like, I know they didn't learn that from me. <laughs> they have not seen this from me. I don't know where this came from. Right? You don't need to teach your kids how to lie. You need to teach your kids how to tell the truth. <laughs> and more importantly, why they should tell the truth. But as bad as it is to watch this stuff come out of your kids that you know you didn't put in there, it's even worse when you see them doing things that you have taught them, but you didn't mean to. So, like, for our oldest son, Elijah, I mean, if he gets a little too excited sometimes, if he maybe gets a little bit too affectionate and hugs a little too hard and too strong, it's not necessarily his fault. He got it from his mother. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal. Original sin... Total depravity. It isn't about doing good or bad things. It's about our relationship with God. That's what this is talking about. Our sin has rendered us, our sin by nature and by choice, renders us spiritually unresponsive to God. 
This is why we need to be born again. It's not because we're not physically alive. It's because we're not spiritually alive. This goes back to the problem of idolatry that we focused on last week. D.A. Carson explains this so well in his book, The God Who Is There. He writes that a lot of people think that sin is just breaking a rule. What's at stake here is something deeper, bigger, uglier, sadder, and more heinous. It's a revolution. It makes me God. And thus, it de-gods God. I become the judge. I say what's right. I say what's wrong. There's no God who tells me what to do. I decide. Now, when you consider that God is the source of life, the source of love, the source of good, the giver of every good and perfect gift, he is the only self-sufficient being in all of the universe. God is constrained by no one and nothing but his own good pleasure. For eternity, the Bible tells us that God has existed, Father, Son, and Spirit. He's completely self-sufficient. He doesn't even need a creation to experience relationship. He has that within himself. Everything else in all of creation is dependent on him. And so in light of this, Carson says, if God is the creator and gives life, then if you detach yourself from this God... What is there but death? This is the death. This is the spiritual death that I think Peter is referring to. This is why we need to be born again. By nature and by choice, we detach ourselves from this God, pursuing pleasures apart from his glory, away from a context with which he has said we could, and for a reason other than pursuing his glory and our ultimate good and the good of other people. Now, if we miss this, we miss the gospel. I'm hammering on this so hard because if we miss this, we miss the gospel and we miss God. We are dead in our sin, spiritually unresponsive to God. Our problem is not that we do bad things. It's not that we don't have the right information. If you believe that, If you believe that the real problem is that people don't do good things, then your gospel is going to be one that tells people how to do good things and to stop doing bad things. If you believe that the real problem is that people don't have the right information, then your gospel is going to be giving people more information. And that's not the gospel. We need to see what the real problem is before we can see what the real solution is. A couple of years ago, we sent a team out in Milwaukee to interview folks to ask them what they thought the biggest problem in this city was. Almost everybody, at least the vast majority of people said they thought one of, one of if not the biggest problem that our city faces is segregation. Now, without question, segregation is a problem in this city. I wouldn't say that it's not. But if you believe that segregation is the real problem, then your solution is probably going to be integration. But do you know what happens often when people pursue integration? Gentrification or white flight. Like, Milwaukee's biggest problem is not that black people are segregated from white people. Milwaukee's biggest problem is that all people are segregated from the heart of God because of their sin. And until that issue is dealt with, the rest of the stuff is just dealing with symptoms. Our biggest problem is that our hearts are segregated from God's, and there is no way out of that mess. And so Jesus came into it. He took on our flesh. He came into our mess. And being fully God and fully man, he demonstrated to us everything we need to know. Being fully God, he personally demonstrated how much God loves his creation, how much God loves his people. Being fully God, you see Jesus loving his people. He heals the sick. He plays with the kids. He spars with the intellectual elites. Jesus loves his people. Being fully God, being fully man, he demonstrates how we can perfectly relate to God. He prays, he fasts, he seeks solitude to just go away and be with God. He says that he cannot do anything other than what he sees the Father doing. He says that serving, doing God's will, is his food. This is so comforting. In his book, Delighting in Christ, Michael Reeves says, There is no God in heaven who is unlike Jesus. 
a God who loves so relentlessly that he would sacrifice himself to eternally secure that love for you. Our sin has caused us to be unresponsive to God. And so when Jesus hung on the cross, bearing the full weight of our sin in his body, God the Father was unresponsive to him. Jesus took on flesh and he died our death so that we could be born again and live by his spirit, having our hearts fully integrated with the heart of God, receiving this gospel, being born again, fully alive, a new creation. This is the gospel. The gospel isn't about making bad people good or dumb people smart. The gospel is about bringing dead people to life, being a new creation, a completely new creation, a new person causing us to be born again by the Spirit of God into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is the gospel. So we can have hope. You can have hope. You are not too far gone. doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you have failed to do. There is no sin you can commit that is any match for Jesus' love for you. Your sin is nothing more than a drop in the ocean of God's love that can fully absorb your sin, cleanse you from the inside out, and restore your relationship to Him. And this, church, this is a love you cannot lose because it's a love you didn't find. Jesus finds you, right? The Bible says we're lost, not God. God's not the one who gets lost. We do. And he finds us and he saves us. And Jesus secured God's love for us on the cross so now no one and nothing can take it from us. He earned it. And this also means that no one you care about is too far gone either. We must share the gospel with those who are spiritually dead now so that they might live by the Spirit. Even those who persecute us. Even those who are skeptical. Even the mothers who have hurt us. Even the children who have rejected us. Do not give up hope. As long as there is breath in a person's lungs, there is hope that the Spirit of God can make them a new creation. This is hope that we must intentionally pursue. What could be more dreadful? What could be more dreadful than standing on the edge of eternity, face to face, with the judge? eternally suffering the consequences of detaching ourselves from the source of life, of love, of goodness. So the gospel must be preached. It must be preached. It must be proclaimed. It must be shared so that though people may be judged in the way that people are in regards to the flesh, they might live according to God in regards to the Spirit. Church, this glorious life-giving hope has been entrusted to us, no one else. Not the paid professionals, not the, not the blog writers, not the meme generators, to us, to us in our relationships with our friends. And we must pursue this. This is our job. This is our privilege to share the gospel with people.